Hello and welcome to a Thwack Livecast.、Uh, we're going to be talking about an IT journey to monitoring glory, and this is the first session of three. So we're going to do back to monitoring basics.、Uh, so I'm not here alone today.、Uh, I have a couple of、uh, close friends with me. I have、uh, both Crystal and Leon. And say hello, folks. Hello. hello. Yay.、Um, we're going to talk about going back to basics. I, We're going to talk, and you're just going to have to deal with it.、Uh, we're going to talk, and we're going to go on rants because we're all very passionate about this. I think everyone started monitoring in a maybe a similar vein, but not exactly. We all started at different times in our lives, where the technology was slightly different. And for me, that was when、uh, literally my manager said, "Hey, we just bought this thing," and it was like on a CD. And he said, "And I just installed it. This is the server name and the RDP information, and learn it." And I was like, and "Cool!" <laughs> and yes, it was. It was literally like someone pulled the gate at the dog track, and I was off, and I just fell right out of the gate because I didn't know any of this stuff. So,、uh, Crystal, how did you get started with monitoring in general? My very first experience with monitoring was building like three hundred network atlas maps. That was my job. Fun for several、oh. days. Last weeks was building network atlas maps.、So、that was my very first experience because、uh, I came into monitoring directly. That's where I came into IT is right into monitoring. So that was that was how it started. Nice. Wow. And, and you survived. You actually put up with the hazing, and so they let you keep the job. Anyone like, who puts up with three hundred network atlas maps gets to keep the job.、Uh, I've been in IT for about thirty three years now, and I've done monitoring for about twenty of those years. And、uh, yeah, oh. Old. So what I、uh, what started it was、uh, a a consultant sold the company where I was at the idea that the monitoring would just take care of itself. They didn't need to maintain it. They didn't need to update it. Nothing. It would just automatically do that stuff. And a year in, about a million dollars worth of software is just a pile on the floor. And they said, "Okay, Leon, here's the deal: you can learn in production on our time, and we will not hold you responsible for that, and you won't leave." Until it's fixed, deal, deal. So that's what I did for about three and a half years. Is you know get it from completely broken to working across the globe. Nice. I also like the fact that you said you've worked in IT for approximately thirty-three years. It was very specific. I'm glad you stopped referring to it in months because it just got tiresome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hard to do the math. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. Still right, early. Yeah, got it.、Um, so we're going to cover some. We're going to try to cover a lot. We've got roughly thirty minutes and a little bit of extra time for some Q and A. We have an agenda here. We're going to try to stick to it. We're going to take a couple of breaks during this, so we can kind of check to see if there's questions in the queue, and if they are something we can answer live. We're totally going to do that. If you do not see the chat, then you have not logged into Thwack. Please log in, and you will see the chat this way, that way, this way normally. All right.、Uh, hey. So I'm not going to read this. Everyone can read this. All right.、Uh, so. I think this is a question. Now, none of us got this、no. because we weren't as part of the decision making. It was already done. But I just want to discuss. Let just for the very for a couple minutes. Let's talk about this very first thing. Why did you or your organization buy a monitoring solution? And I don't care whose it is right now. Just why did you buy this thing? And we've had we have heard hundreds of different variations of this. I think. How many customers do you have? That's how many to, stories we've heard. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a specific one. Like I said, I was handed it, but I've heard people are like, "Oh, well, this mission critical thing went down, and we didn't know about it all weekend." And I think that's probably most know, common. Yeah. It's it's common. I think they fall into certain groups. One is that you know audit demanded we have something, and so we might as well just use it. There's also something broke, and we never want to feel that kind of pain again. Um, whether it was a specific kind of pain, like we had some network monitoring, but then our server broke, and so we decided to keep on going, you know, like that kind of thing. Or they didn't have anything, or they had batch files, or whatever, and they realized they needed a real monitoring solution. And then there is the, you know, sort of internal champion who said, "We've spent all this money building blah, and we should probably make sure that blah is happy. So let's go get the tool to do that." I, I think those are the three of the major categories of stories that we tend to hear.、Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other one is、uh, the vendor included it for free. No,、uh, yeah, that happens. Sure. Yeah, that that one's that one's always interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
the other thing or you need to the vendor included this other thing for free and it uh didn't work but we realized that we liked the idea of what it could do so now we need to get something that actually does work yeah that that does what they said it would do and these other things that we realized oh we have a we have a you know a, a hole in our infrastructure where we're not keeping tabs on these kinds of things uh, yeah. Other questions you have to ask yourself if you have the opportunity, if you're just getting started, it's also not a bad idea to kind of recap these occasionally is, do you have security domains? And what I mean by that is, do you have, do you care about things in the DMZ with this particular solution? Do you care about things in the cloud? Do you work across multiple domains? Do you work across, a security domain can mean anything and everything, but realistically mm -hmm. it's, do you need to cross boundaries? And boundaries used to typically mean firewalls and now it could be mean any number of things. All right. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of leads into how do you want to authenticate? Because yeah. local creds are good, but they're not great. There's There are better ways to do this. Because I, I personally yeah. am not a fan of having 11 versions of my current password all over the world doing these different oh things. And I don't actually do that. But I did. I was young once and I, I, was, I was dumb. And, but you know, this one expires on this date and that one expires on that date. And this one you didn't log into for a month. So it's automatically disabled. Now, now find better ways to do this. Yeah. And when your, uh, when your password expires for your monitoring solution, bad times ensue for all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, when you talk about how do you want to authenticate, it also includes how do you want uh, you're monitoring your sort of service account items to authenticate. Yes. How are they going to? And, and I realize that that's probably a topic that is its own thing, but you also have to think about how they are going to connect and push or pull or grab or interact with data along the way. It's another consideration to just ask yourself. Yeah. And Crystal, you already teed up the next one for me. So yeah. please, by all yeah, means. The Size, sizing for your environment for monitoring is a big question. And it's like the leading question in any sales call for anyone trying to sell you monitoring is what do you have? And the biggest point, the reason why this is so hard for so many people is because a lot of people don't know. You're, yep. you're building your monitoring and then you don't, you don't know what you have. You don't, as, as a friend of mine likes to say, you don't know what you don't know. Um, it's just a thing. You don't know what's out there necessarily. You think, Maybe you have a good idea, but the, the fact of the matter is a lot of people don't have as good of an inventory as they think that they do. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Spitball right. and You're then at, at least 50%? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's obsolete the, the minute the ink dries on the paper and usually 15 minutes before that. Um, I would also say that speaking, again, vendor agnostically, uh, finding the, the unlimited trial, finding you know the version... I, Speaking specifically, 30 days unlimited means as many boxes as you want to throw at it. So the the cool part about that is that you can stand up an environment and throw everything into it, like all your devices, mm -hmm. scan everything. That gives you the, a sense of how much monitoring you're going to need, yeah. um, rather than trying to piecemeal it or buy you know a license of this and a license. And so that, and this, you know, that way you're not feeling like you have to go back to the well because oopsie, we forgot this. Yeah. And it's something that you would uh, revisit on a mm -hmm. reasonable basis. We'll talk about some of that later. But for me, I always built mine for three year life. It would be like, this looks, mm -hmm. my best guess is this is okay for three years. And then the operating system is going to need an update. The software is probably going to have much of upgrades, and I may we may be using different har hardware in the infrastructure. So it's time to redo it anyway. Yeah, and I just want to throw out there that you even if you have like a regular cadence of revisiting this, when things happen, like say I don't know, the whole world goes to work at home, then you probably ought to take it some time after after you've recovered from that a bit to reevaluate. Then, because the reality is, you just implemented a whole bunch of new stuff that you might need to monitor that you didn't have before. So when those big events happen that you have to add a bunch of things at once, you know, also also consider reevaluating after that. Yeah. Well, I think we could just talk about that one point for another 45 minutes, but I, I, have, some other, I have some other slides. But we won't. Not today. <laughs> Not today. But yeah. if you want us, let us know. We will talk. We will, we will gladly talk about sizing and challenges. Let us know in the chat. Uh, when we really talk about the basics, this comes down to protocols. And 
I'm just gonna put this on the screen for everyone to be able to consume it and speak to it real fast. There are realistically three kind of major brands of protocol and there are obviously some minor distinctions within these, but when you talk about network systems infrastructure monitoring, there really is SNMP, which has been around forever and a day, talk over PC, TCP port, send it some type of authentication and what you wanna get and it sends you back data. Cool, done. WMI for Windows is, we were joking the other day and we were talking about this, like we cannot believe WMI has been actually been out this long since NT4, mm -hmm. Service Pack 4. Same kind of thing, but you're not stuck on a single port. It has one of those kind of, uh, do they, I think they call them ephemeral. I don't remember ephemeral the Ephemeral ports. Things. Yeah, where mm -hmm. basically you ask, you, you make a call and then after the first call, it's like, how about you talk back to me on this port? And you're like, okay, I'll talk you back on that port. So that is a little more, Security questionable, but you can also change that with group policies and registry hacks and all kinds of other stuff. So that's all completely changeable. And then the last one, which is more prevalent probably in the last, I'm gonna say five to seven years, I guess, seems yeah. feels about right, um, is API interfaces, uh, application programming interfaces. These are normally some type of web-based call. And the, the interesting part about APIs is that they are, which I won't call appies here, are APIs is that they are basically vendor specific. A vendor builds it for a purpose. You can sometimes get data out of that. Sometimes it's only for making changes, but there's multiple different ways to work with it. And you need to be cognizant of all of those types of things. Right. I just want to interject here that the WMI of the three, the WMI is the one that is going to cause you, surprisingly, the most amount of heartache. If you have any mm -hmm. kind of firewall, WMI is the is the problem to solve because it's not just ephemeral, it's all ports from 1024 to 65,539. And those ports change in the middle of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless, as Kevin said, you lock it down, which is a non-trivial thing to do. So WMI is not typically something you would use from, say, your D those those uh, uh, those domains, the security domains we were talking about earlier, from the DMZ inbound or whatever, because you'd have to look at your security team and say, yeah, I just need you to open up all the ports, all of them. Is that okay? In which case, they'll, they'll no? be like, thanks, no thanks, and new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to throw out that A, I refuse to call APIs appies. Absolutely not. I will not do that. Um, but B, oh. I think that as a new monitoring engineer, that APIs could be quite overwhelming. Like if you you're coming into this, SMP is fairly straightforward. WMI has its parts where Works. it's not as straightforward, but for the most part, it's okay. APIs because they're vendor specific. I think that you might feel a bit overwhelmed, like you have to learn a whole different thing. Like it's like learning a new coding language, but it's not, it's not really. Documentation is out there and that's helpful and yay internet. Yeah. <laughs> yay internet. Yay. Uh, also, if you're, if you're not necessarily super new on your monitoring journey, you're probably gonna deal, see some of these, uh, I call them ancillary protocols because they're not the ones that are most primarily handled around your infrastructure. And that's stuff like SMIS for storage vendors, which is not applied, I found this out the hard way, is not applied universally across all vendors or even across all models. It was meant to be a standard and it kind of, sort of, maybe kind of is, but not really. Um, uh, Windows RM or WinRM for Windows Remote Management, which is, and also kind of a, an aside to this is WSMAN, uh, which is another way to get in as opposed to a remote procedure call over DOM and a couple, we can get really like nerdy on this. We're just, we're just gonna list them for now. Uh, IPSLAs, uh, Cisco kind of has this naming. Juniper has something like it. A bunch of the other vendors have something similar. They all basically do the same thing. They run little transactions out at your edges or at on devices and then you can query to get that information back. And then we have SNMP traps, syslogs and NetFlow. And I grouped them together for a reason, because we want to talk about this. Because the way data gets into your monitoring is really one of two ways. There is the inquire where on a specific schedule, a routine at a specific time, or when you request it, the system will go out and make a call and bring it back. And Leon, if you wouldn't okay. mind. Dear server. I'm writing to you, requesting you provide me with your current CPU utilization. Kindest regards, your monitoring system. And thank you, sir. So <laughs> this is essentially what happens. You basically send a request, it sends back some information, the monitoring system chops it all up, slices, dices, does whatever mathing it needs to do and stores it. But that's different than the inform. 
Uh, sometimes people call these push and pull, sometimes, but that really depends. Push and pull is always interesting because it depends whether you're talking about from the endpoint or from the server. So mm -hmm. I don't like mm -hmm. that language. Um, the other one is inform, which is the target element unsolicited sends information to a monitoring system. And this is incredibly, this is syslogs, this is traps, this is NetFlow. Basically, you send data all the time. And uh, I think I'll do this one because I actually had this scenario. Basically, when this happens, the monitoring server says, hey, 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 stop. I got a problem with my fan. <laughs> that is all. And then your system has to be able to take that information and work with that as well. Uh, this is, this can be non-trivial to set up. I know this, uh, sending syslogs and traps, basically touching every single device in your infrastructure to get them to send them all the same way to the same location can be non-trivial. There are ways to make it easier. Uh, if you have some type of configuration management tool, it makes it incredibly easy. If you have some type of store and forward solution like a syslog trap server, that kind of takes that first. So you can point everything to that or even better have that behind a load balancer. So you have some kind of like a uh, virtual IP in front of it, gets all that stuff and then sends it out where it needs to go. We can talk about all those things if we get to questions. And then the, we jokingly said this is a dirty word in monitoring space, but it, it is and it isn't. But everyone, if you're in the monitoring space, or even better, if you are a sysadmin and someone says, I want to install an agent on your server, what's the first thing you do? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, it's just a, because I think we've all at some point had some type of agent go haywire. But it doesn't have to be a bad word, especially if it's something that's self-maintaining, pluggable, so you can, uh, you like, a new thing came out. Well, I have to sh delete the whole thing. And, and No, all you have to do is basically just add this new file into this plugin folder, and then the next time the system and or service restarts, it just picks it up. Uh, realistically, yeah, agents, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I want to just add on that, not just as it from the sysadmin standpoint, but also from a monitoring engineer standpoint, that um, sometimes we have a violent reaction. I'm not going to say monitoring engineers of a certain age. I'm going to say monitoring engineers of a, uh, who have a, a encountered certain tools where they were either entirely agent-based or they were significantly agent-based, mm -hmm. and the management process for those agents was less than delightful, where <sighs> You were constantly either in a state of uh, being an EMT doing chest compressions on the agent to keep it running. The mm -hmm. other thing is that if you didn't have a way of knowing whether the agent spontaneously stopped on a machine or was stopped by those sysadmins who are like, I don't know what this is. Let's get rid of it, you know, or whatever it is, or pushing it out to a fleet or updating a fleet or understanding conflicts. All those things are wrapped up in putting another piece of software on a box that's supposed to be doing a very specific purpose built job. And I think that's why a lot of us have sort of a violent uh, reaction to agents as an anti-pattern in monitoring. Yeah. yeah, and there's also the added conundrum of troubleshooting an agent. Like you mentioned, if it stops responding, you don't know why. But it also means that if you're the monitoring engineer, the likelihood is you probably don't have access to all those boxes where you installed agents, which means when you go to troubleshoot anything that's going on with them, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have to involve the sysadmin who is in charge of those boxes, and they're not gonna enjoy being part of that either. Um, so yeah, there are definitely challenges, but there are benefits as well. Yeah, yeah, I think the biggest benefit for me is this is one of those things that can easily, I'm not gonna, can easily cross the security domains. Like if you put, if you decide that you don't need an engine in your DMZ to do, to do some type of polling in that space, you can always put an agent on the servers that mm -hmm. live in that location. And then they can report back on one or two TCP ports to a very specific IP address. And it makes your security team a whole lot happier for building that one, maybe two firewall rules as opposed to you know opening up all of WMI. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually a really good way. But agents at the, at, at the kind of, if you strip back the layers and the, the fear, what agents do, I'm going to say probably 80, 85% of the time, is just make local calls that your monitoring yeah. system was going to do anyway. So instead of just calling yeah. it over the wire, I guess we can still use that term, instead of calling it over the wire, it does it locally, and then either the server checks in, says, give me your info, or it just sends it unsolicited back. And that's yeah. why they can be right. inform or inquire. Okay. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I think we beat that one pretty well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. All right, let's do a quick check. How are we doing on Q&A? 
quick check. A couple of the questions came in. Um, the just working our way backward through topics, um, uh, David had a couple of questions. The first one is: Is Solomon's going to support? Uh, oh, sorry. Can agents run as less than admin or system privileges? We're trying to run least privilege monitoring because we are monitoring, uh, not remediation. So that's the first one. And yeah, there is actually um, there is a guide on least privilege. I don't remember if it's part of the overall Orion admin guide or if it's its own separate guide. I, I can't remember. But if you go Mandy, to uh, um, the it success in the chat, center, so. support.solowins.com. Uh, mm -hmm. you'll be able to find how to set up monitoring and least privilege for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think Mandy put a link in there. Is that what you said, Crystal? Yes. OK, cool. Uh, what else we got? Yeah. Uh, another David question. Thank you, David, for joining us today. Can, uh, is SolarWinds going to support Windows machines over WinRM without having to use WMI for the pollers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that the out of the box now? I'll have to read the article to understand exactly what's happening. Uh, David, I'm more than happy to ha continue this conversation with you, but you can actually change it in the advanced configuration. We're not going to dig into that right now, but you can go to the advanced configuration and basically say, I want everything to pull over WinRM first and then have a fallback to WMI. So as long as the far side re, uh, responds to WinRM, you should be fine. Now, granted, the WinRM stuff, when you get to the machine, is basically making WMI object calls. If, if you know that, then I'm, we can go crazy with it. But it basically just makes uh, WMI calls or C CIM calls and does that locally so you don't you know, go over the network with that data. Yeah. Right. So Wex was asking, how do agents work in or and or with Docker? I like this question. That's a great question. Um, so, so go ahead, Leon. Go ahead. OK, fine, I'll go. Um, <laughs> so um, if you have a persistent container that acts just like a server, you can absolutely install an agent on it, and it will pretend it's a server. It will think it's a server and it, you can install an agent on it. It's the same thing as a cloud instance or, you know, a VM. It's just, it's it's a thingy that thinks of itself as a server and is behaving in the same way. And so you can run an agent. If you're just talking about monitoring uh, your containers and how you do that, we have an entire uh, system sp set up specifically for container monitoring. And very briefly, what you end up doing is having another container that is running on your orchestrator that is watching all the other containers that get instantiated and broken down and all that stuff. And that's how you get uh, a sense of what's happening in your overall container environment. So that's that's the short version. The long version, there's a couple of SolarWinds Lab episodes. I think there's actually some um, special videos on it also, but that's the, the quick and dirty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Much better than my answer would have been because I couldn't remember the word for orchestrator. <laughs> ah. <laughs> All right. Uh, any more or want to move on and see if we can answer some of them as we go? Let's, let's keep rolling. OK. All right. Uh, a discussion near and dear to everyone here's heart is that yeah. you need to explain to management, to your C-level, to your coworkers, to anybody and if you want screen cap this if you have to <laughs> monitoring is not alerting if you bought a thing to make sure you get an alert when things happen that's great but do not confuse the two they are distinct even though most nms's and specifically the ones we're most familiar with the orion suite do both they are distinct portions of it uh, and you say, no, wait, Kevin, that's not right. How are they distinct portions? I will give you the scenario I give everyone. Think about everything. Do you want to monitor everything? In a perfect world, and money is no object, and I have all the resources, yes, I want to monitor everything. Do you want to get alerted every single time something happens? No. No, I don't, because right. I like email to be manageable or I don't want a million chats, or I don't need the system to automatically build 500 tickets when a thing goes down. There's just, yeah. just get it through your head here. Sorry, they are not the same thing. And there would mm -hmm. be no way to keep up with it if you did get notified on everything that was happening at all times. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a trap. I'm gonna say it. I think it's a trap that a lot of people that are new to monitoring fall into 
because they're like, but I, I'm using this thing so I know when things go bad instead of just having like a dashboard up and refreshing all the time. And, and I get you, I understand it. But if you're getting notified for everything, you're gonna stop paying attention. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you have a rule in your Outlook, Gmail, whatever, if you, have a, if you have a rule in your mailbox that immediately moves things, messages from this monitoring system and puts them right into a subfolder and or moves them into the global bit bucket, i.e. recycling bin, your alerts are not working properly. Yeah, no, there. you've already admitted defeat. Yeah, it's, it's now a chance, now you, the only hope you have is digging yourself out and that can be hard if you've already alienated everybody who also happens to be getting these messages. So please think about this before you get started or like we said, on some type of regular cadence. We kind of went back and forth about this. And what do you do? So you, you've you got a solution. You're like, yes, I'm, I'm going to get NPM and I'm going to add an NTA or I'm going to go with N NPM plus SAM or something like that. This is what I want to do. Okay. So you've, you've run your proof of concept. You've run it for your 30 days. You're like, I understand the basics. I can get things in. I know how the alerts generally work. I can get information back out of it. What do you actually need to do when you're ready to put the license on there. Now first, which is not covered here, do not license your POC. Build new from the lessons you've learned. You've learned lessons with that POC. That's what proof of concept is for. Whatever lessons you've learned, build new, install, that's where you license. Um, but I think one of the things, and I'm at fault on this, is sometimes when I'm kind of in a zone, I don't wanna be in meetings. And if I'm yep. like kind of head down with something like a new product that I'm trying to get out for everybody, I, I don't want distractions. And what I should have done is before I even started that, I needed to have these meetings. I need to have them on the books with everybody involved. And these can be super simple to start. But Leon, we talked about this a time or two uh, or three or 15. Yeah, yeah. It's So there's a difference between that being in the zone building things and the um, finding out what it is that you need to build. And I think the thing you need to do, and it does not come naturally for, um, for us as IT pros, is you need to focus on what the business needs. And we're going to probably come back to this message a few times. And I am very sorry because it does mean that you need to learn to speak business. And that is a constant soapbox that I've been on for quite a while, but you can build the most beautiful monitoring there is that does gloriously technical things and the business doesn't care because it doesn't solve a meaningful problem. Even when you've solved a problem that is meaningful to uh, the desktop team or the server team, but it doesn't translate to actual business dollars. Um, Keith Townsend, CTO advisor said, just find out where the SAP installation is and attach yourself to whatever they need because that's where the money is. It always is. So, but, and I don't mean SAP specifically, but find out what the important drivers are for the business, whether it is the customer order entry app or it's the CRM or it's the document management system, whatever it is, the business cares about, that's where you want to find out what are the problems we need to solve here and what tools do I need to solve those problems. I, I think that that's, and you will still have a chance to fix things for the desktop team and the server team and stuff like that. But you're, even though those seem like quick wins and easy, you know, e easy things, it's not going to impress anybody who actually has a, a spending limit. Yeah, and I'll I'll add to that. Um, not not just mentioning the business because I'm not going to go into that any further than Leon already did. But um, any meetings that you want to set up with people that are going to be using the monitoring or the data coming out of your monitoring, that's important. I mean, I'm not a DBA. I don't know what they care about. I might think, hey, this seems important, and set up monitoring on it. And they're like, why are you sending us these alerts? So if you mm -hmm. want if you want other people to take your monitoring seriously then you need to have those conversations about what they care about, especially if you're limited and you don't have that beautiful, glorious, unlimited licensing. If you're limited on your licensing, then knowing what they care about helps you set up your mon monitoring in a more meaningful way where you're not just monitoring whatever you think might be important. You're monitoring what is actually important to the team that actually takes care of those things. Yeah, and that can change from instance to instance, from server to server, from team to team. Uh, the, the SQL, the Microsoft SQL team cares about FTEs and the Oracle 
team cares about weight statistics and this team cares about those. And they're all related, but they're not necessarily the same. So you have to have these discussions. And this may not be the very first thing you do. Maybe if you are a network engineer, because let's be serious, this is probably not going to be your primary job. You have a different title other than monitoring engineer. And this is just another hat that got placed on your head. Uh, one of these days, we'll actually get prop hats for this. Uh, <laughs> be great, right? But Might it's be. probably an additional thing. So. Really, I mean, do what's important to you first, but don't forget that you got to talk to your management because they're you have to go from the very, very beginning of this. Why did your company, organization, whatever, purchase this? That's where you should start first. Like, can we solve this thing, and then we can go beyond that? Yeah. Uh, right. The second point gets us a lot of funny looks when we tell people this. Uh, Crystal, you had a passion about this. I do. No. Yeah. Yeah. Because one of, so not, uh, not Orion, but when, uh, Sam, which used to be, uh, Lem, which used to be Trigeo, um, when Sam came around the, originally it had a ton of out of the box rules, which are their version of alerts configured. And they just, it was nonsense and they were automatically turned on by default. One of the best quality of life improvements that I've seen since <laughs> since it was acquired um, was them not turning those on by default anymore. They were off by default and they became templates, which is all your out of the box alerts should be. They're templates because you don't, uh, going back to what we mentioned earlier, you don't want an alert for every device going down and back up. Who's paying attention to that? Or you don't want an alert for every time the status changes or every time uh, the, the, uh, your CPU hits 90%. Like, okay, if it stays at 90% for 10 minutes, maybe I care. But, like, I don't need it every single time those things happen. So, like, use them as templates. They're beautiful, beautiful templates. They're very useful. But don't just turn them on out of the box and let them run how they are. People will not take it seriously. And then you're going to be backpedaling with all of those people that presumably, if you followed our advice, you already met with to see what they – what they cared about. If your alerts don't follow what they care about, they stop caring about your thing that you're doing. I, okay, so I'm gonna make t-shirts for all three of us. Turning off out of the box alerts is self-care. Mm -hmm. self I'm absolutely yes. um, yeah. And Barry actually was asking this in the chat just now, and so I'm just gonna mention it. You know, how do you cut down the noise? And this is literally the answer to your question, Barry. Number one. Is you turn off everything. Um, you turn off all the stuff, and then you start turning things on that are targeted, specific. Um, they are sophisticated. It, you know, my grand, my grandmother looked at the recipe on the back of a Lipton soup box, and she said, "This isn't a recipe. This is a vague suggestion. I'm never mm -hmm. doing this." <laughs> and the same thing with our alerts. They are there to show you. For example, did you know that when something happens, you can grab the top ten uh, services that are running or processes that are running? sorted by CPU, sorted by memory, sorted by IO. Did you know you could do that? Well, you can. Do you want to know how to do that? There's a de there's a template alert in the de in the regular default alerts that show you top 10 processes when high CPU. Do I care about high CPU? Probably not. But it's there to show you how to how to make, uh to establish or instrument the top grabbing the top 10 processes. And you can model off of that to do all sorts of other things. All the alerts are like that. We're just showing off, did you know you could do this thing? Mm -hmm. That's why they're there. Not because they're we all, think they're any sort of best practice. Yeah, they're all they're all some version of humble brag. It's like, look how cool this is. Look what it can do. Uh, and, <laughs> but that is one of those things that like, and I am a culprit for this, leaving no down turned on for every single thing in your infrastructure and sending it to a general mailbox is a great way to have nobody in your corner. So part of that yeah. is talking to these people. Uh, Leon, we got incredibly caffeinated and talked about this for, it felt like four or five hours, but the caffeine dilated that. So I think we only talked for like 35 or 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, we've already covered why you need to be purposeful on this. This kind of goes hand in hand with the alerts. Like why, like when, when you have these meetings and when you're like, okay, we're ready to start monitoring Active Directory, just picking something. We're ready to start, act, and we've talked to the identity team or we talked to the AD team or whatever the team's called in your organization. We'd like to do this thing where we go ahead and look at it and we pull this information back. I want to point it at a pilot location, a single machine, and bring information back. I'm going to show you stuff. There's a chance none of this is going to be read 
because our, our infrastructure is brilliant all the time. So nothing comes back critical or warning. Um, but I need to know which of these you need to know about. And once you have that, and once they say, no, that looks good, that's when you move that particular template, app insight, network insight, whatever it is, that's when, and it doesn't matter where, what solution is in, that's when you move from that pilot to put it to the rest of the organization. Do not skip that step. Do not unilaterally do discoveries and import everything. You will have a very tough time, especially if that can kick off any alerts. Very, very tough time. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, passwords. We had some back and forth on this because we did. I want, because there, if your system doesn't natively use, like the, the Orion platform has uh, local creds that it can use. And the admin is the out of the box. We make you pick a password. It cannot be blank. There is a guest account if you've moved up with this, but that's disabled now. And I'm not even 100% sure whether it's actually even added now. If you want a guest account, you have to build your own. But you probably already have a couple of these accounts. Uh, maybe not so if you're a network engineer, uh, depending on how your organization does authentication. But if you're a systems engineer, you probably already have a pair of accounts. You've got like the me account, like this is me every day. It has, has my email attached, has this attached. And then you probably have some type of escalated permission account, you know, username dash admin or ADM dash username or something like that. You already have those. So why not, you know, just use something that can do that. And if you have something with AD, you can turn on integrated uh, AD. You can do the LDAP configurations. You can do uh, SAML or uh, uh, SAML or something like that using you know Azure mm -hmm. AD or ADFS or any of those types of things. Don't necessarily redo the wheel. So think about this. And if you if you don't happen to have this second admin account, please do so. And Leon, what would you say the admin like? It, we'll use Orion as a difference. What's the difference between those two accounts? Okay, so um, the just to, to underscore, because I have seen lots of folks who don't have this level of discipline, and, and I am going to be judgy and call it a level of discipline, that the account that you have and the account that you log in with is the account that has all the rights that you need to do your job day in and day out, and that is incredibly dangerous. Anyone who has ever accidentally typed RM slash dash RF uh, may realize why that's a problem. It just, you shouldn't work in day to day in the account that has, you know, super duper God mode. So if it isn't part of your discipline to use two different accounts, to have the regular account, which is just, you know, Joe user, and then also then have to change or elevate your privileges to do something, uh, maybe consider doing that both in as a sysadmin, but especially as a, you know, SolarWinds Orion monitoring admin. You want to seg segment those two things. Also, it means that you can set alerts for when people log in to their admin account and you can track those things and know when certain things are happening. It just gives you that additional level level of uh, watchfulness to what's happening. And as far as um, the the default passwords and stuff like that, yeah. I, and I, I've been using SolarWinds since 2003. So the habits I'm talking about are things that have developed. And to Kevin's point, admin requires you to set a password now. It didn't used to, but now it does. There used to be an account called Guest, which I would always disable and call Goober. because <laughs> So no one could find it. I just it. wanted to get rid of it, yep. right? I mean, just- But you there. wanted to keep and it there in case you needed it for something later. Right. Right. Well, you weren't sure. Like, you know, yeah. again, it was 2003. I was new to SolarWinds. I didn't know if any part of the system maybe hinged on having that account. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure. So and and I'd been around for more than 15 minutes. So deleting accounts is dangerous. We, you know, a lot of us have borked an entire system just by accidentally deleting the, an account that you thought, who's this root person? I don't yeah. need this. You know? Yeah. Uh, ask me how I know. So anyway, <laughs> um, so what you want to do also is, um, where was I going with this? Help. Ah, where I, I, I have you somewhere to go accounts? with it if you want me to pick up the torch there. Um, yeah. somewhere to go with it is don't use the admin account because as, day -day. as I mentioned, day -day as Leon mentioned, there's tracking. So if it just says admin and you have several people who are using that admin account, or someone was using it and they don't work there anymore. There's a lot of problems with that. It's it's very generic. It doesn't tell you anything. Even the user tracking, you'll have a hard time if more than one person has access to the admin account. So do yourself a favor, 
use more specific accounts. Um, and also like going right into what's the line underneath that, determine who needs to be admin. We really mean this, who actually needs admin permissions. I can't tell you the number of times that I've gotten calls from people um, in my old life, gotten calls from people who are like, this thing changed and we didn't change it. It changed all by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it did not. That's not how that <laughs> works. Does not change all by itself. There's somebody out there who has permissions that doesn't need permissions, or we didn't know it was it was going to change it for everyone. Then you that don't one. need admin rights. That, you don't understand one. how this works enough to need admin rights if you don't understand it's going to change it for everyone. So make those determinations. I think a lot of people get uh, stuck in the in the loop of making multiple people admin accounts, and then. Sometimes if they're more smart, if they're smarter about it, they do some limitations on those accounts. So it's like only their devices, but really, really think about who actually needs admin, admin rights. And I know it's easy to say to just, to just give someone admin rights because you don't have time to deal with their nonsense right now and they can go add their own stuff, but there are much more granular permissions in there. Take a look, familiarize yourself with that so that when they ask for something else, if you really don't have time and you really have to give them this permission because your boss said to you or whatever, be more granular with it than just flat out giving them admin rights. That's my suggestion. Yeah, and, and I remember what I was gonna say, um, two related ideas. One is service accounts. We I mentioned it earlier, but service accounts, so we know that applications also may interact in some way with monitoring, setting up a service account with very, very limited permissions. For example, a good, uh, just a good simple example is you've got screens in the knock and the screens in the knock are set to different, you know, Orion screens. And all it needs to do is log in and see this one screen. So you can lock down that account, that service account. Don't let it log in with admin. Don't let it log in with, you know, make it specific to the point where you can have, you know, knock screen one, knock screen two, if you want to. A related idea, because what we've just described is a whole lot of account management, which is the last thing. And it, you know, what? this admins never say, I wish I could manage more accounts. I really <laughs> wish I could spend more time just managing, creating, deleting, checking accounts. That's what I'd like. That would be great. Said nobody ever. Never. So, <laughs> so I want to point out that both Windows groups and also SAML groups, that single yes. sign-on groups, that you can tie into groups already in your Active Directory directory, LDAP, uh, single sign-on system, whatever it is. And you can then, whatever goes into that group will have the permissions that you've given the group. So if you say that you want, so let's say that you have an Active Directory set up where everyone has the me account and the me-ADM account. And the ADM account is admin and, the me, and people already have that discipline of logging in. You can just add those two Active Directory groups into Orion and give the group the permissions you want. And when people log in with their Active Directory password and user, they're going to get the permissions you gave them. So mm -hmm. that's another important thing. And same thing with service groups, service accounts. If you already have service accounts in existence, you can give them the permissions by adding the group. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure. And uh, you know, I remembered, so I I got I wanted to make sure I talked about that. Yeah, and I know we're already over time, but I'm not stopping. I'm, there's no stopping this train because Ooh. I think we all need <laughs> yeah. to have this discussion. Uh, but I wanted to say that we are going to put a survey in uh, the chat. So if you have time, uh, we would love you to take that. And we also want to know what else you want to see us do for livecasts. Uh, the last one here is think about ways to partition your data. And this has to do, I think, partially with like what users can see and also how you want to organize for you know, your alerts or your reports or how you want to think about groupings. or th there, You don't necessarily have to make this decision at the very beginning, but you have to think about this moving forward. And the easiest way to get the simplest solutions are geos and teams. All the things in this location, all the things managed by this team. Those are simple examples. But keep those in mind and build your own examples that work for your organization. And I've seen people that have, no joke, I think I saw someone in one of our chat channels say they had 1,200 groups. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend that many. But no. depending on the way you use your system, you may need that. Please don't. But you know, you build it for the need. Don't just build yeah. it because you think yeah. it's cool. Um, and just a hint of like, well, how would I do that? Custom properties. That's my ASMR monitoring for the day. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's custom properties are your friend, and I'll give you the so yeah the twofer is those you know 
uh, custom properties and then dynamic groups that build off of those custom properties. Hey, hey we're talking. Wait, we got we got a slide for that. Wait, we got a slide what? for that. We're, we're not there yet. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Slow, slow your to roll. To be continued. Shh. Spoilers. QA check. How are we doing? We got anything sitting out there? You guys are <laughs> you're burning to answer. Um, yes, we do. We have a great question. Um, what if you inherited something that already has custom alerts, but they're not being paid attention to? Should you disable the alerts and start from scratch? So the, an the answer to that is going to be it depends. I would suggest if you know they're not being paid attention to, disabling them and instead of starting from scratch, see what people complain about not getting <laughs> because yeah. that means that they care. So like, um, you know, if they're really not paying attention to them, then yeah, disable them, get rid of them, don't use them, start over. But honestly, have those conversations first. If if you could change, if you're if you're new to it and you're coming into it fresh, it's a good opportunity to rehab those meetings and say, okay, what can we be doing better with this? Because you're clearly not getting these alerts or you're not paying attention to them, which means they're not meaningful to you. And meaningful alerts is the only way to have alerts, actionable, meaningful alerts. If you can take action on that alert, that's what you need to get. Um, if it's just informational, it's fine to be in monitoring. If they really want it, set it up, but I guarantee you they're gonna regret that. Um, but Put I have in been in situations where the argument has been made to get those informational as, as emails and you're like, oh, okay, but you're not going to want it. Call me in two weeks when you want to disable it. So, you know, to have those conversations though, you really talk to them again, if they, if it's a specific team or a specific, um, whatever it happens to be, you know, they're the owners of it and you know, they're not paying attention to it. I have seen many many installations where people literally have a subfolder as Kevin mentioned earlier, all of their monitoring alerts go there, which means, and then they complain when something goes down that they didn't know about. Well, you're not paying attention to it, which means your alerting is bad. It's mm -hmm. bad. Start again, try again. Um, it's not a bad thing to try again. Do you don't want to put yourself in a position though of, of not alerting them on something and then getting yourself into trouble because you yeah. disabled it without speaking to them first. So I would suggest, you know, reopening the conversation. You're new to it. It's a good opportunity for you to say, Hey, I just picked this thing up and I understand you guys are using it. What can we be doing better? Yeah. Everyone wants to know what what wants to be able to tell you what you're doing wrong. They want it. They want to tell you. And to you, it can't be personal because you just inherited it. So mm -hmm. it's not like you did anything wrong. Uh, it's yeah. easy. It's easy to have that conversation. They get to tell you what they hate about it. You get to hear it and fix it for them. Everyone's happy. Yeah. I think Love we it. basically just covered all of monitoring or all of alerting in like a 12 minute segment. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't use out of the box. If people aren't reading them, turn them off or edit them so they do read them. Informational alerts are bad that should be just written to a log. There's other kind of strictures that we're glossing over, but they're all there. Uh, other questions? So uh, another one was a question about uh, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication uh, for logging into SolarWinds. And uh, we don't have that in the sort of the, the local login, but you can get that by using if you have multi-factor authentication in your Windows Active Directory login or in your single sign-on tool. Mm -hmm. um, that is honestly, as a monitoring engineer, as a architect of monitoring solutions, that is the right, right way to do mm -hmm. it, is to have people using the existing account they already have. It cuts down on your account management. Sure, you're gonna have a couple of, I won't say backdoor accounts, but you know, you're gonna have a couple of side accounts, that local admin account, but not many and heavily tracked and heavily, you know, you're not going to do, do that. So that's, you know, that's how you're going to get that multi-factor authentication in there. There is also card authentication well, okay. and other things in there for, uh, it mostly, it, it's a lot used by federal and incredibly high security, but multi-factor, obviously, you said is a little more universal now. It doesn't really require like extra hardware. It's just kind of an extension of the, your identity management system. And if you have to use like a physical token, some type of card, or mm. the, uh, I guess the RSA used to have like keys that had numbers on them or some type of mm -hmm. third party app, that's fine. We can totally handle that, but it's gotta be part of your actual authentication process. We're not gonna build like an extra wrapper for that because why remake the wheel? It's already been done. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, first things first, fixing real problems. Uh, again, why? Did your company buy this? Why are they paying for your time to invest in this? Why are they paying for the storage? Why are they paying for the CPU cycles? There's a reason. Find it 
and find a solution for it. Even if that solution is, I will let you know when this thing's running hot for 30 straight minutes. If that is the very first reason the company decided to put a monitoring solution in, that's the first thing you should do. Find a way to do that and make sure it gets in front of the right eyes and the right people and consider that part done. Because a lot of people, I'm, I am 100% fall into this trap. I like to see all the things, but if that's not what the intent of the, the, the solution was, I need to make sure if I want to see all the things, I got to see this thing first. Yeah. yeah prioritize. Yeah. Uh, other ways you can get that is obviously ask teams about their pain points. We already said you've got to have meetings. We're sorry. I know you're IT people and some of you don't love meetings. Have them. They're actually going to be with other IT people first, and then maybe you'll have to get some business people involved about their important systems. But start, start with a couple of meetings. Get some type of cadence in there. Uh, yeah. I came from a help desk, so service desk is also on this list for me. Right. Well, and, and if you're wondering, like, what should I solve? If you look at the ticket counts for particular kinds of issues and you see that there's just one item that happens over and over and over again, that is a great candidate both for monitoring and automation. So if you want to, you know, show off your automation chops that we can actually make this ticket disappear, no one will ever have to answer it because we will simply do the Gefrinkel command, which fixes it every time. We won't wake people up at two o'clock in the morning. That's a great one. I also want to reiterate something Crystal said said just a little bit ago, and that's about the ask teams about their pain points. Um, somebody had asked, like, I have all these bad alerts, what do I do? Well, the asking team about their pain points is an ongoing continuous continuous improvement, the screw thingy, uh, you know, process where you go back, plan to go back to these teams every six months, not every week or month, but every six months, year, and say, look, you asked me for this monitor or this alert or this thing. How's it working for you? And they may say, actually, it's completely irrelevant now. Things have changed. Or they may say, you know, it's good, but it could be better by doing this other thing. Or, you know, all these other types of, you know, like these conversations. You have to keep going back and finding out. And that's where you're going to find out. This alert, actually, we just delete it. We don't care. Or you'll hear the horrifying one. You're like, actually, we don't do anything when we get the first alert, but by the third one in 30 minutes, then we know there's something wrong. How Ow. about I just send Ow. you one if the thing has occurred three times in 30 minutes? How about I do that? Because I don't yeah. get paid by the bushel for alerts. <laughs> so, But that's where you're going to hear about it, is going back to teams who've requested monitoring and saying, what is this doing for you today? Is there more we could be doing for you? And so on. Yeah. That's, and that's another thing about uh, I'll, fixing I'll say too, once you've established that relationship, you know, you do it two or three times, they're going to start coming to you outside of that six month check in to say, yeah. hey, by the way, we changed this because they now care about what they're getting out of your monitoring system. They know you care that they're getting the right information. So you'll you'll build this relationship. So it sounds kind of clinical and uh, administrative all up front. And yeah, it is, but you're building relationships with somebody on these teams. And hopefully, you know, that person doesn't leave and you got to do it all over again. But we all know it's reality. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, make sure that you're monitoring the stuff that they care about and they know that you care. If you implement it and revisit with them, even if it's just a quick email that says, hey, remember when we did this six months ago? Is that still working? Like, an email takes you like five seconds to write. We all know we're fast typists these days. Like just get it out there. It costs you almost nothing. It makes them feel better about their monitoring, uh, but what you're monitoring. Uh, it makes you feel better about having things that people are going to actually care about. Yep. And le uh, so that also kind of comes in for the last standups. Those are the regular meetings you have every quarter, six months annually. Uh, it's also good when you have, if, if your company can allow you to un know when someone's onboarding on another team to introduce them to your monitoring solution so that they know that they are, uh, we're, um, like they're a web dev or whatever and their servers are being watched by this thing. So they understand that you're going to start getting these things in and I need, and I would love to build a relationship with you about that. If you can get that into your onboarding, that's even better. But worst case scenario is just make sure you have these meetings to have the FaceTime with people so they know you continue to care. Because there's nothing worse to a monitoring engineer than silence from the alert recipients. There's yeah, and you know, I do want to emphasize um, that we, 
we keep emphasizing this, that we care and that we want people to care about your monitoring. And this is because monitoring should be a tier one application. It should be critical to your business. If it is critical, if you're monitoring critical infrastructure, your monitoring system is therefore also critical in infrastructure. If, if you don't get a message that a critical piece of infrastructure is down, and that's a problem, you should be caring more about your monitoring system because you're not doing it. So the reason why we think these important, these relationships and these conversations and all of this that, you know, you make sure you're doing the things that they actually care about is so important is because it is critical to your business infrastructure, whether or not some people believe that it is. And it is sometimes an uphill battle in an organization that they don't care about the monitoring. Show them differently. Yeah. I mean, by way of example, briefly, is um, I set up some monitoring. Some monitoring existed for the exchange team, and they were getting about 80 tickets a week on that. And we sat down, we had these conversations about what really matters to you, what's actionable, what's the thing that we have to you know, wake up or bother you folks for actual human intervention versus what are the things that could be automated away or whatever. We cut those 80 alerts down to about eight a week. But the the difference was that now every one of those eight alerts was answered within about five minutes, regardless of time of day, because at that point, the exchange team knew they could trust that the thing that they were getting was, in fact, actionable. It wasn't just that noise. It wasn't questionable. It wasn't like, I'll get to it whenever. It's probably nothing. And, you know, again, 80 out of eight out of 80, they were right. 72 percent of the, 72 times out of eight, out of 80 they were right it was just nothing and those other times like sorry boss i missed it you know it's usually nothing but whatever now they knew that the message they were getting were always actionable always meaningful always important and it changed everything yep yeah uh and the last one here is seek guidance from other monitoring professionals not just us we're good we won't we will not lie about this we have spent a lot of time in this discipline we spend a lot of time in this space we know a lot about a lot but I'm not going to have experience with every single type of device. I'm not going to have experience with every type of application. And that's where something like Thwack really kind of fills that void for a lot of people. Just go and ask questions. First, search, see if someone's already had, uh, there's someone talking about a specific SD-WAN provider. You know, I can't get good interface numbers off of this. And someone was like, oh, all you have to do is change this to that. Or here's this custom polar, or here's this custom template. And you can just download and put it on. And, and also, if you can, if you're comfortable with it, you know, go to meetings. Find groups where there are people like this. Uh, we're going to try to get out in the field as soon as possible, but just interact with the community any way you can because IT people are a tight community and they'll have your back. All right. Uh, we're going to, we're not even going to show a demo of these. These are the easy wins. If you came in and you're using uh, the SolarWinds network monitoring products, so that's the network performance monitor, the flow traffic analyzer, configuration manager. What am I missing? Other things. If you're basically using that <laughs> stack of tools, I know there's a lot of tools in the portfolio. These are some easy wins. Uh, and we actually had, there was a previous livecast series, which you can see on the page you're currently on. Uh, down below, there's a link to the archive. All three of these are in here where we talk about why each of these are important and how they can kind of help your organization make wise decisions, especially something like NetPath, where you troubleshoot the internet, which is technically not your job. Right, but it is kind of awesome. Uh, it, is, it is pretty, it is sick in a good way. All right, uh, we, are, we are well over time. Uh, I say we postpone this and turn this into a thread that we pick up on Thwack because I think it's really good. It's something that, uh, I, this is where I want to put in the Road to El Dorado GIF, both, both, yes. both because that's no, how both. I feel about these things. Uh, I, the more question I do want to raise up that yes. somebody asked is um, some folks had, I don't know, life. They had, yeah. you know, they had, they got pulled away. Their internet was flaky, whatever it is. And they're saying, is there going to be a recording of this? And I actually don't know the answer. So is there a recording that people will be able to go back and watch? There should be. It will, all the live casts, it'll, it'll be cut. It'll be fixed. A lot of our ums should be cut out and should be down in the archive. You can just go to thwack.com slash livecast. And don't forget, this is the first of three in this kind of, topic of uh, IT discipline for monitoring. And the next one is on August 4th, same time as this one. And we'll probably have the same runtime, so maybe we'll update the invite. And then we have another one on September 8th. Uh, both are going to be really, really good conversations where we basically just take the next steps. And these are steps that we came up with as a group that we all took essentially along our monitoring journey to get from 
you know, I inherited or I th was thrown into this up to I am comfortable to be, be a representative for the solution at my company. Uh, we are so out of time. Any questions there that you absolutely feel like we have to answer now? I think that I would rather answer them on Thwack. Yeah, I think so too. So please find us. Uh, you can find me on Thwack at, at KM Sigma. Uh, Leon, you are Adato Le? Adato Le. Adato Le. Le. Yes, Adato yes. Le. Mm -hmm. Crystal? Crystal T87. All right, so you can find us on Oh, Black you know what? That's my, that's my Twitter handle. It's just Crystal T. <laughs> just Crystal T. Okay. So T. you can find us uh, on Thwack. Feel free to make us friends, and then you know we can talk and have the conversation continue. So for myself and both of the co-hosts, I want to say thank you very much, and we will see you next time. Bye, all. Bye.